Great, so hello everyone. Welcome to day four of the Cambridge Conference on Catastrophic Risk. I hope you've all recovered from last night's catastrophic quiz and perhaps like me, you're feeling a little bit ashamed of just how well you know the oeuvre of Britney Spears. Um, I'm delighted to be share chairing session six on governing science, who is doing our scientific research and why. Before we jump in, as ever, a few housekeeping notes. Please note this session is being recorded, but no attendees can be seen or heard. You should be muted on arrival, and I would like to ask participants to please stay on mute throughout the session. Please do use the Hoover or Zoom chat box in the web browser or mobile app to ask questions at any time. And if you could include your name and affiliation, that would be great so we know who we're talking to. The session once recorded will be uploaded to YouTube and the Center for the Study of Existential Risks website after the conference. There's been some great live tweeting going on and the hashtag for this conference is triple CR2020. And if you do want to find out more about the Center, Center for the Study of Existential Risk, CSER, please visit cser.ac.uk. And a great big thanks to the tireless Tom McLean, you, you can see hopefully there, um, who's been live drawing the entire conference. You hopefully should be able to see him on your screen. Um, my name is Lalita Sundaram. I'm a research associate at CSER, where I work on biological risk, in particular, the regulation of emerging biotechnologies such as synthetic biology. So it's a real treat to be able to chair this session because issues of regulation and governance, how to be responsible scientists are close to my heart. In this session, we'll be looking at the role of scientists and actually researchers of any stripe, those who study catastrophic and existential risks, but also those working in areas where the research might itself contribute to those risks. What incentivizes this research? What impact does culture have? We'll explore the influence and pressure that funding might have. Is it always or solely a question of money? What other sorts of influence might be at play and what do those look like um, against different political backdrops? So to help us disentangle some of this, our first panelist this afternoon was going to be Heather Roth, who, had who has several affiliations. She's a senior research analyst at Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Laboratory and an associate research fellow at CSER's sister organization, the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence. She's also a fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. Prior to this, Heather has held positions at DeepMind in Ethics and Society, at the Department of Politics and International Relations in Oxford. She was a special government expert for the US DOD Innovation Board and has held fellowships at the New America Foundation on the National Security Initi Initiative and the Future of War Project. So as you can imagine from all this, Heather's research interests are quite varied, but thematically they all involve the law, policy and ethics of emerging military technologies, autonomous weapons, AI, robots, cybersecurity. I think many of you will be familiar with her work on normative principles for AI in national defense, for instance. So she looks at all these issues in the context of human rights protection and with a political scientist lens. In fact, her PhD from the University of Colorado was in political science, building on a master's from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and her bachelor's at Arizona. After that tantalizing introduction, I'm very sad to say that unfortunately, Heather had a family emergency last night and is unable to join us this afternoon in person. So I'm sure you'll all join me in wishing her and her family the best. It's of course a disappointment, but we can still enjoy her pre-recorded talk in which she raises a lot of very timely issues about how political systems and research impinge on each other. What it means to have freedom of thought and freedom of research under some of the types of regimes we're seeing around the world. I think you'll agree that these topics are ripe for discussion. So even if Heather can't answer your questions directly, I'd encourage you to use not just the Q&A functions on Hoover and Zoom as you've been doing over the past few days, but also especially the community and chat channels to stimulate discussion among all the participants. And our second panelist, in person, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Stuart Parkinson, the Executive Director of Scientists for Global Responsibility. For those of you who aren't as familiar with SGR and its work, I hope Stuart will give us some more detail later on. But briefly, it's an organization of about 700 scientists, engineers, and related professionals. Its aim is very much aligned with what we in the catastrophic and extras community hold dear, that is, 
to promote and coordinate research, education, discussion, and to further the ethical practice and use of science and technology. Now, I think Stuart's career path is fascinating, particularly for something that happened very early on. And again, I hope this is something we can quiz him about in the discussion. He was pursuing his bachelor's in physics and engineering at the University of Lancaster, and during an industrial placement, found himself working on military engineering projects. And during this placement, began to ask himself some uncomfortable questions about the industry he was beginning to be a part of and the ethics of this kind of career. So much so that after this degree, he changed direction and obtained his PhD in climate science using his skills to mathematically model global climate change. Stewart's continued to work on a combination of these issues since then, on climate and energy policy at the University of Surrey's Center for Environmental Strategy as an expert reviewer for the IPCC and with Friends of the Earth, looking at the link between the environment and social injustice. Alongside this vast experience in climate policy, Stuart hasn't forgotten those early seeds of doubt about ethical science and technology, and particularly the role of institutions with perhaps outsized influence. He's written extensively on a wide range of topics that will immediately strike a chord with many of us in the audience. The pressures that corporate agendas and military influence can have on research, security policy, the links between military policy and the environment, and fundamentally, what it means to have an ethical career in science and technology. So, while, unfortunately, as I said, we don't have Heather with us live for the discussion that will take place later on, I am so pleased that two of my colleagues from CSER are joining us to keep the conversation going, and that so Stuart isn't too much in the hot seat, and I'll let them introduce themselves briefly. So hi, I'm Jess Whittlestone. I'm a senior research associate at CSER. Um, happy to step into this discussion. I work mostly on thinking about the sort of long term impacts and risks of artificial intelligence, which I think is a field that is really just starting to grapple with some of these questions about what responsible research looks like and what the responsibilities of researchers are. So I'm going to be really keen to sort of think about what we can learn from other fields that have been grappling with these questions for a little bit longer. Hi, yep, uh, similarly very happy to step into this discussion. Um, I'm Tom Hobson. I am a newish research associate at CSER. Um, my work is mainly around two themes. I, I work a lot on trying to understand military interest in and investment in emerging technology, especially biotechnology. Um, I'm also, well, hopefully of relevance to this discussion, very interested in understanding research, science, technology, and innovation as social and political practices as much as just empirical ones. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. So with that, I'll let you sit back and enjoy our first video. Thank you so much for having me uh, speak at the conference today. I'm quite excited to, to engage in this topic on technology, science and technology governance some of my remarks today are going to be more along the lines of, of boundaries and boundary setting and understanding the nuances of definitions, as well as understanding some of the practical difficulties around the notion of governance. So we often consider governance to be a solution to many problems around science and technology development, from the Asilomar principles to uh, on recombinant DNA, to thinking around autonomous weapon systems, to um, any sort of disarmament conversation, as well as even from genetically modified foods, we really do have um, a wide variety of instances and cases where governance was um, undertaken in one form or another. However, it is, and however, I would say that, you know, it would be wonderful if we could have a very clear law, a policy, or a norm or some sort of coercive mechanism that could govern um, the designers, developers, companies, governments, or even just individual uh, tinkerers in their garages or their labs um, to ensure that responsible research and innovation takes place. But that in, in some instances is a bit of a hopeful wish. Governance as a, you know, governance is an umbrella term that encompasses many different types of uh, regulation, of potentially coercive regulation, or of even self-censorship. 
And so really understanding the myriad forms of governance also is difficult because what we're talking about is science and technology, which in and of itself is such a broad term uh, to encompass so many different kinds of technology, so many different types of scientific endeavor. Um, and to, tie, to try, I think, to think about science and technology governance is, is so big, is too broad, and draws the boundaries in such a way that any sort of practical guidance would almost be useless. Um, so broad brush approaches to science and technology governance really end up falling into two different camps. One camp um, is the kind of, you know, we, it's so big, it's so broad, it's so diverse, we cannot possibly govern it. And so in that instance, it's just the wild west. We should let everything go. The best ideas will percolate, percolate up to the top um, and there will be some sort of clash of ideas and norms and the, the best or the right will win out. We also, that, that is a false narrative, um, as we know. But the other, the other side of that coin is the other type of reaction, which is we must ban all of these different types of technologies or scientific endeavors um, because they are too risky. They can escalate into too many um, adverse reactions or um, dis disastrous consequences for humanity writ large or for a specific subset of a population um, for the environment. And so because there is this sort of false dichotomy between everything is permitted and everything is, imp is, is impermissible and therefore banned, through some sort of legal mechanism which is yet to be determined, that seems to me to be um, drawing, you know, drawing the boundaries and drawing the, the guide, putting the guideposts too far apart. Um, and it also tends to um, push us in one direction or another that is not entirely helpful because scientific endeavors can go in, again, a, a wide variety of directions and how those scientific endeavors and technological developments evolve um, are also not unitary, right? It's not one person or one organization that's doing this. In fact, it is more of a patchwork quilt of lots of different entities, individuals, organizations, funding mechanisms, um, and, in, and in some instances, international partnerships. And so we need to be much more uh, nuanced in our thinking about how to uh, govern technology. So I think that to be more nuanced in our thinking and to be, you know, a little bit more gracious to our scientific counterparts and our, our, techno our technology developers, um, we have to think about all of the different kind of layers of analysis or levels of analysis in political science, as we call them. Um, and there's multiples of these, right? There are the obvious ones in the room, there's the technology developers, there's the companies, the industries at large, um, there's even sectors, right? There's even states and state governments. Um, and then there's multinational coalitions and there's non-governmental organizations and there's professional societies. Like all of these entities are in some ways a level of analysis with, with which we can look to um, to try to understand who's doing what and how we can best shape and incentivize the right behavior. And I would actually suggest that instead of talking about governance, what we're really talking about is incentives. Um, so one of the incentives that is, is incredibly strong and is also incredibly difficult to study and change is culture. Um, scientific cultures vary across disciplines up until recently, you know, the, the computer science uh, discipline really didn't have a culture, so to speak. Um, everything, no one thought that they had any sort of moral responsibilities um, or legal responsibilities in their development. And now we see that changing. Um, the medical, the medical you know, field has long had lots of, of these moral uh, guideposts and, and obligations. Um, whereas in the legal uh, fields as well, but some of these other newer disciplines do not. That said, the culture of, of even an individual, not just an individual discipline, but even an individual lab 
um, can, can vary quite greatly. And so this kind of push to understanding the cultural variations and where the incentives are within the lab, within the discipline, within the university, within the company is really, really increasingly important if you want to enculturate responsible research and innovation. Um, so that's one side of the culture argument is that scientific culture um, and, and what good looks like. You know, risky behaviors may be rewarded in some instances and not in others. We see this in fact with a lot of the, the, the outcries around um, genomic engineering and, and, and things like this coming out of China. Um, but the other thing too is that scientific cultures are one part, but this is kind of a Russian doll effect, right? They're nested. And so there's other cultural elements that are gonna affect attitudes towards innovation, who's included, who's excluded, and who the proper authorities are. Um, and that question of authority is actually increasingly important because the cultural aspects um, around authority also tend to bleed into questions around regime type and whether or not a state's, uh, the characterization of a state's regime matters or influences how technology is developed. And so one can be an authority, um, that is someone who may be a subject matter expert who is widely respected in their field, but someone can be in authority as well. And this is more about role responsibilities and the types of powers um, and rights that that role has. And those are two interesting ways to, to dissect this as well, is because if science and technology development is beholden to, is beholden to a particular type of role or an authority, um, that can very much color the ways in which technology is developed as well as how it's deployed. And so the governance in that aspect takes on a completely different meaning because if those in authority are demanding certain types of technological developments, there seems to be something slightly um, off here about what we talk about when, we, when the, the assumption about technology governance if the authorities are telling you to do unethical things, where does the governance really lie? Um, so as I said before, I think the regime type argument is also very, um, very crucial when we're talking about meaningful governance. And we can, we, coming out of political science, we can think about a wide variety of different kinds of regimes. The three classic, classic characterizations, right, are democracies, authoritarian governments, and I would then say totalitarian governments. And the major difference that I think will push, uh, well, maybe push back against governance is the difference between not just dem dem democratic regimes and authoritarian regimes, but really the presence of totalitarian or hybrid totalitarian regimes. And a totalitarian regime really is its main purpose is to break down the division between public and private, to erase the capability for freedom of thought, um, to erase the capabilities for freedom of speech. Thought and speech, at least in John Stuart Mill's work, right, are very clearly linked. And so when you break down the division between the public and the private sphere and you no longer have that freedom of thought and freedom of speech, you start to see where technology can, can very much be designed to, to maintain that status quo. Um, we can think of this um, in China currently with the Uyghur population, um, the, the internment camps, um, the reprogramming and, and propaganda, um, or even very highly surveillance states, right? And the use of particular technologies to continually monitor, surveil, and manipulate a population. And in one instance, actually in Professor Reese's book where he talks about in chapter five around transparency um, and perhaps an end to privacy as a cure for this, um, that surveillance in some sense might be a cure to, to ensuring proper governance seems to me to flirt with um, a cure that is, that is worse than the, than the illness. And so I would be very, very careful around that because it starts to creep into these kind of discussions around 
the use um, by particular regime types of technologies for very malicious purposes. So, and when I say meaningful governance here, right, if you take, um, so if you take the Chinese case, for instance, you know, the, the, the regime itself, it's a law and order, law and order regime on paper, but for instance, the judiciary is very tightly bound to the party, the communist, Chinese Communist Party. And so there isn't really a division between, you know, the governing body of the, of the party and the, and the judicial branch. Not to mention all of the use of, of things like internment camps and othering and um, attempts at reprogramming uh, and, and propaganda. And so I think there is something quite unique when it comes to the flavors of totalitarian regimes and how that can very much influence the, the trajectory of scientific and technological development. Um, and if we're looking to the state or we're looking to legal entities to put coercive mechanisms and regulations in place, that turns it on its head when the state is requiring uh, the types of technological developments that perhaps um, not just democratic states, but, but even in some instances, probably some other types of authoritarian states would, would take issue with. And I say that, you know, some types of authoritarian regimes as well, because democracies are not going to be good all the time. And as I, as I give this talk, I'm in the midst of waiting on presidential <laughs> election results in the United States. And what we can see in this instance is that even within a democracy, there can be very strong leaning authoritarian personality and psychological traits among populace. And if that is true, then those individuals who are creating technologies um, can also engage in, in the development of technologies that could potentially uh, violate the rights um, and, and, and privileges of, of of a large swath of, of, of at least this country, not to mention the proliferation of that technology across international borders and how that affects the world at large. And so um, personality, authoritarian psychological traits um, are present everywhere. And so that's something also to consider that we, we can't really govern a, an authoritarian personality trait. What we have to do is to put into place uh, better education. Uh, we have to enculturate responsible and ethical design. We have to think about uh, the kind of the Western liberal democratic values of, of individualism and freedom of thought and freedom of action and freedom of speech. And so those are the kinds of things that are the bulwark against the psychological authoritarianism. Um, but those are not things that are easily, easily governable and when we're talking about the technology creation um, by not just, you know, we can say companies and industries and sectors and governments, but all of those entities are made up of people. And so the people creating those, those systems need to have, um, need to be encultured into the way of, of responsible research and, and innovation. And that is not an easy lift and it cannot be done by a top-down mandate or some sort of coercive legal norm or, or law or rule. Um, that also said, thinking about whether or not certain types of sectors or, uh, uh, should be prohibited from, from engaging in, in scientific development um, and technological development. So for instance, there's a lot, a lot of focus on whether or not militaries um, and states military should be allowed to pursue scientific development. And, and truth be told, so many of our scientific breakthroughs occur in basic research um, that it would be hard to, uh, to stop basic research and governments tend to fund basic research quite heavily. Um, and so there would be some difficulties, I think, in parsing out what is and what is not allowed and when, when risk assessment frameworks have to come in and who should be deciding. Uh, you know, in the United States instance, you know, should Congress be deciding? Should the military be deciding? And the reality is, is that many of the people in these governance positions, particularly policy positions, do not have the scientific background in order to, to, to effectively and wisely make any sort of policy or legal recommendations. And so that in and of itself brings risk 
of over-regulating or under-regulating when you don't have an edu a scientific educated populace in order to do that. And so ultimately I think that there is, there's not really one single shot approach or solution to technology governance. We have international fora, we have non-governmental organizations, we have states, we have industries, we have people, we have all sorts of different types of actors at work here. And I think there needs to be a carefully considered distributed system, right? This needs to be coordinated in some sense, but it needs to be distributed because much like as Madison has said in, the, in Federalist number 10, Federalist paper number 10, you need factions, you need lots and lots of different factions to balance against one another's interests. And it is only with the countering of factions with more factions can you actually maintain um, kind of a steady state. And if that steady state looks like responsible research and innovation, then that push for the development of norms, that push for the development of, um, of a different way of thinking that designers and companies and everybody are all responsible at the same time, then that kind of, that, that distributed faction, that distributed control, that distributed uh, governance approach can, can start to take shape. But there is no one single shot. Um, and there is no, even at the international stage and at the international forum, there's no global enforcement mechanism that could even begin to, to think of it that way. And nor should we want a single global enforcement mechanism because our entire international order is premised on, on the foundation of state sovereignty. And to give an international organization the ultimate sovereign power would be to create a world state. And I don't know if anybody, <laughs> at least in my world, uh, wants to see that happening because all of the states have their own incentive structures, their own foreign policies, and their own desires for power. And so much as we federated the international system, so too must we federate the ways in which we, we create governance mechanisms, soft or hard, distributed or centralized. And so at that, I will uh, leave you to think about culture and how culture influences things, how regime types actually influence and drive innovation through funding mechanisms and through dictates of, of what should and should not be pursued. And then, um, ultimately about this, this distributed uh, way of thinking about the world, the, matter, the, the Madisonian Federalist 10. Uh, and I hope, I hope that gives you something to chew on as we move forward. Thank you. Hello, I'm Stuart Parkinson. I'm gonna talk about science governance and, uh, and the relationship with existential risk. So, um, quick recap of what's being talked about earlier in the conference. Um, we are not in a good place. Existential risks, I won't go into any detail here, but um, the, you know, suffice to say, environmental risks, climate, there are things even worse than climate change, biodiversity loss, nitrogen pollution, for example, the COVID-19 death toll is frightening and increasing. Um, but there are other pandemics around the corner uh, against the backdrop of nuclear weapons, modernization, nuclear treaties are being dismantled. Um, and to summarize it all, um, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists with their doomsday clock um, have pronounced it's 100 seconds to midnight. And I think it's useful just to point out that even when an understanding of, of existential risk, risks are communicated to policymakers that doesn't always result in adequate action. And I just want to point here to the situation in the UK where we have in the national risk assessment among the top tier one risks um, is highlighted pandemics. And, um, and yet Britain was among the worst responding countries in in the industrialized world, um, which shows, again, the work that needs to be done. So how much of all this is a science governance issue? Well, responsibility for understanding and tackling existential risks is dispersed 
among many organizations. What I want for, without going into a lot of detail here, what I want to focus on is that the science community as the body with often the most knowledge of the risks, we have a responsibility to do more and arguably much more. So who holds power within the government governance of science? I've presented here the obvious movers and shakers, the funders, the organizations that perform the research, the professional bodies that set the standards for research. Um, and in influencing the decisions made in these bodies are, is um, the role of individual scientists. We can affect these organizations often who themselves are not recognizing the importance of existential risks. And um, I've presented here some examples from the UK, some figures from the UK, which give an idea of where the relative power in terms of funding lies and uh, business as, as a funder and as also a performing sector is dominant. But there's still a lot of money that's being awarded by public research bodies and um, being spent by universities. And this is where the research obviously tends to happen for existential risks. But if we can lever um, funding in some of the other sectors as well, then that can make a, a significant difference to the amount that's available to us. So this leads into my first proposal, and I've got a number of proposals for how to improve our, our situation. Um, and the first one here is, is simply and obviously more funding for research and existential risks. Um, what I've done is tried to give an indication of what I think is a good level to um, target. And um, uh, based on, on my experience of dealing with these sorts of organizations, I think arguing for something in the realm of at least 5% um, in a public science body. So for example, a research council in the UK, um, we need at least 5% spent. It's not too much to ask for 5% to be spent on existential risks, on understanding and, and proposing solutions um, to existential risks. And in some cases, this could be far larger. Um, so for env um, environmental risks, for example, um, I think spending is already higher than this amount, although detailed figures can be hard to come by. Um, and, and following the, these suggestions, I um, mean, doing the arithmetic, this would give the UK a, a total spending um, of around 400 million a year on understanding and, and looking for solutions for existential risks. And that's the sort of level I think we should be aiming for that might actually give us a chance to um, tackle many of the problems. And if that was repeated across the industrialized world, I think we would be in a far better place. And, and in tandem with that, we need to establish um, better dialogues between governments and researchers and having being able to command that amount of money would um, give us, uh, put us in a much more powerful position to argue that we were important enough to justify um, better, a better position and better um, recognition from government, along with the fact that we are facing existential risks um, rather more frequently than the government anticipated. Um, so how do we leverage, leverage this extra funding and influence? Well, this feeds into the remaining proposals that I want to talk about. So the first one is about more education within the profession, within the science and engineering profession on existential risks, more university courses, more training courses as part of professional development and um, uh, the road to chartership within um, various professions. Um, if we tailored the, um, the education to different science, scientific disciplines or professions, then that would make them particularly relevant. And I, arguably they would be quite popular. I think in university, I think young people are quite um, inspired by courses on, on how to save the world or at least trying to understand how the world might be um, destroyed by our foolishness. So um, 
And I think the school climate strikes here show there's a real appetite for this stuff. So doing as much of this as we can. And on the professional side, um, recognizing the role of international treaties, for example, arms control treaties, um, in the, the need to be aware of, of these treaties and the obligations and how they affect professions is, is a route in to um, um, more education work in this area through that route. Um, the third proposal is around improving science communication. And there are so many options here um, where I think we could engage as researchers. Um, the doomsday clock that I mentioned earlier, I think is too simplistic. It's trying to take too many risks and, and fit them into a one dimensional device. So um, let's take a, a leaf out of some of the um, planetary boundaries work. And um, what I'm going to suggest in a second is, is a warning light system. Um, we also need some more public facing science conferences. So it's great that we're doing an event like this, but I think it's really important that we do more of these events to the public, make them more high profile by working in tandem with some of the national academies like the Royal Society, for example. And if we do them online, then we don't have to fly and we don't contribute to the existential risk of climate change. Um, I think also activities and displays of public science festivals, fairs, museums, there, there's enormous scope here. Um, I visit science museums quite frequently just for fun. And it, it makes me sad how few of them actually take any of these issues very seriously, even ones that have public recognition like climate change. And um, the potential for collaborating with science fiction authors, I think is enormous. Um, a lot of science fiction has poor science in it um, and um, building those links is key. And um, another area, another initiative is something called the Science Oath for Climate, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit more in a second. Um, but the important thing here is to inspire action, not hopelessness or complacency. And there's, there's a whole lot written in environmental psychology around this. And, and I think we need to draw on that expertise. Um, so to give you an example of what I mean by a warning light system, it, it's not rocket science. Um, it's quite straightforward, sort of five level indicator like the one on the right. Um, an overall rating for each existential risk and the, the urgency of global action. And then these could be further refined, developed, expanded um, for looking at global risk levels during the next five, 10 years, for example, or the adequacy of, of response at a national level. Um, partnership with national academies would help raise the profile. And we need to draw on the good experience where um, um, in areas like environmental risk, where the, these indicators have been used well, not the um, poor experience. Um, for example, in the UK, we have a UK terrorism threat level and um, they use names rather than colors or non numbers. And um, nobody knows whether a severe risk level is higher than a substantial risk level. So we don't want to follow their example. Um, the Science Aid for Climate is an initi initiative that the Scientists for Global Responsibility has just launched. And it's really aimed at trying to um, encourage scientists to speak out more publicly both about the scale of the risk, but also the scale of the action needed to tackle it. And particularly when it's politically difficult, because a lot of things on we find are being said in private, but not being said in public about the scale of action necessary, and um, particularly in terms of things like economic reform and behavior change of the wealthy. Um, and an important element of this is to take personal action um, so reducing your carbon emissions and showing leadership through through that route and um, encouraging your um, professional bodies and employers, institutions to follow this lead as well um, and, and demonstrate um, what can be done. And the final proposal is around, is arguably the most challenging, but it's also terribly important is to curb the influence of those organizations which are fueling 
existential risks. Um, and the two most prominent examples I can think of are, are the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear arms industry. And, um, but there are others, um, but these are the two I think we should focus on. And what's, what we argue is that um, a tobacco industry style boycott for these sectors is what we need. Um, if you've got science communication that's being done involving fossil fuel, major fossil fuel companies or major nuclear arms companies, then this really muddies. This is a way that these organizations can deflect criticism for the way in which they are fueling and contributing to the problem. Um, and trying to avoid research collaboration as well. Again, this is another way of deflecting um, criticism. And a couple of examples from, again, from the UK, the Atomic Weapons Establishment has spent a lot of time and money on its technical outreach program. So that it reaches into uh, nearly half the universities in the UK. Um, this is a serious issue when Britain is deploying um, well, Britain has, has around 200 nuclear weapons and is deploying 40 of them at any one time. Um, and another issue is around the way in which um, nuclear weapons companies are collaborating in sponsorship of the main science, the largest science education event in the country. And again, there are, there are real issues about um, conflicts of interest and, and um, and green, well, greenwash, it's not quite environmental, but greenwash in a different way, um, ethical wash, if you like. Um, and, and does this sort of money in research and, and um, science communication events, is, is that response, is that the reason why the UK science communication, the science community barely talks about nuclear weapons risks? That's our, our concern. So to recap some recommendations to scientists. So speaking out more publicly about existential risks using, there's a lot of creative um, options here that can be used. Um, it's important to try and use, use the options available, develop better ones. Um, we also need to challenge funding from organizations that are making existential risks worse. Um, and um, particularly in the science funding, science research area. Um, we need to expand education activities through universities and professional bodies and um, lobby funding bodies to support more research and education in these areas. And through these routes, we can then build better links with policymakers. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Stuart, for that wonderful presentation. There's so much there. And in, I'd like to thank Heather as well. Hopefully she'll see this video um, when she's able to later on. That was so rich. And I'm just looking at the clock and wondering how the heck we're gonna fit everything that we want to cover in the discussion, but we'll give it our best shot. Um, while we wait for people to digest a bit and get their questions down, I would like to ask a question using my chair's prerogative. A question for you, Stuart, that I hope kind of ties together what Heather was saying about culture with what you were saying about education. I'm really glad you brought up education um, because issues of responsibility in science are beginning to become part of curricula. Um, you obviously have ethics in engineering to a certain degree. I know I'm beginning to see more and more biotechnology courses in this country address societal impacts as modules within undergraduate and master's training. But for a young ethically minded scientist or engineer, I think that as Heather pointed out, the culture of the lab, the culture of the department, or even as the discipline as a whole, that importance can't be overstated. And that's going to be determined largely by the principal investigator, the boss, the person who holds the grant, um, that person say is final. So how do we begin to reach those scientists? And maybe you could draw a little bit from your experience as someone who's gone through a shift in career. Um, I'd like to hear what you think on that. Yeah, well, I mean, th these are very big issues. And 
I mean, one of the difficulties is that professional institutions, whilst they have things like ethical codes, they tend to focus on things like the basics, don't lie, don't cheat, do your job well. Um, it's all very basic stuff. Um, and social responsibility, global responsibility, as opposed to as opposed to just you know doing your job, your basic job well, um, tends to be an add-on. And um, we're starting to see more ethical ethical codes in um, professional organisations include these things. But again, there's not a lot of specifics. There's not a lot of education educational material. So um, and not a lot of training courses. Um, and me medical science has had a long history of this, and we're starting to see it being that, that um, expertise and that practice being transferred into other areas. But it's only when people jump up and down, um, and um, in general, when the public jumps up and down, civil society organisations start to protest that we get proper engagement on this issue. I mean, we've been banging on about ethical teaching in science for um, we're nearly 30 years old and our predecessor organizations are uh, 40 years old so um yeah it's it's ha very hard to get this message through the un um unesco the Un united nations education science and cultural organization has had recommendations and uh, model courses on ethical teaching for at least 20 years and Again, we're seeing little bits of these seep in. Um, I've run courses in, in universities occasionally when they dare to invite me. And <laughs> but, um, again, it's very rare. Um, and, and we do need as many people, where you, wherever you are, if you're a young researcher or an old researcher, to if you're an old researcher, you're in power to take, position, uh, take the action and, and start to put these courses together and encourage your colleagues to put these courses together um, and if you're a young, young researcher asking for these courses and saying and if they're not there asking why not is very important um, and we, we have to keep banging away and uh, yeah that's that's the easiest <laughs> the easiest answer to your question but that was a bit long-winded not at all not at all and I mean another Bit of encouragement that I'm seeing again I, I can only really speak to synthetic biology in that world is that funders like the EPSRC the um, engineering and physical sciences research council in the UK have a responsible research and innovation statement and I think they downright require all of their grants to have a component um, with responsible research and innovation in it so that is I hope sensitizing the PIs and even if it is just to tick the box having to think about, okay, well, what can we say we've done to address these kinds of issues? And well, speaking of funding, um, I do have a question here for the whole panel, I, I think, um, well, panel, you know, my colleagues and Stuart, uh, <laughs> um, that asks um, about the challenge of the skew that money adds to the problem of research choice. So not just the influence, as you spoke about, Stuart, um, of um, the military or corporate agendas and things like that, but of research questions themselves. And maybe in your fields, um, Tom and Jess, you could weigh in as well. Should I go first or sure. talk yeah. to the others? <laughs> I mean, it, yes, it's a real issue. And um, I mean, you saw the graphs that I put out, most of the money in R&D comes from business and is spent within business. Universities are actually a fraction of the total. Um, those were UK figures, but they are broadly similar for um, other industrialized countries. Um, so it, it does make it very difficult. Um, there are more and more safeguards to help researchers. Um, I think the declaration of interests that scientific journals now require, is it most scientific journals now? It's hard to tell. A lot of scientific journals now require a declaration of interests with any paper. I think that's really important. It's taken a long time for that to happen. 
um, and it's still not there in a lot of areas. Um, but it is, it's very important. It's, it's a lot of it's come out of the health sciences, medical sciences, when um, first tobacco companies influenced the situation and then um, pharmaceutical companies. There's still lots of problems in there. At least we have more or less got rid of the tobacco um, industry, but um, pharmaceutical companies, they do some very useful work, but um, some of their practices are decidedly questionable and, and need much more effort. And one of the things that worries me about the current crisis is that the rush to a vaccine, but access to the vaccine um, across society, and are we going to have sufficient safeguards um, for efficacy and effectiveness um, are, are major issues. We'll, we'll see whether they are properly enforced or whether a rush um, rush to a vaccine and all the excitement that engenders will will mean we will um, yes um, take risks that we shouldn't be taking and will make things worse. Um, yeah. Sorry, did I? <laughs> yeah, yes, 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 yes. And, um, <laughs> before, like, before yeah. I let the others um, weigh in, I'd like to also just include some other thoughts that have been coming in from the audience, that um, not only should we be trying to challenge funding from the organizations exacerbating X risk, but um, one should also try to encourage growth and funding from the organizations and companies that reduce risk, not just in terms of funding, researchers in X risk, but the, you know, the, the so-called good guys. Um, and within this, sorry, I, I've, been, I've been forgetting to attribute these questions. That question, the first question was from Didi, um, whom you heard from yesterday. And uh, this latest comment was from Anders Sandberg, we also heard from. And related to a comment slash question from Nathaniel Cook, um, a lot of people in the X risk or catastrophic risk community have a relationship of a kind with people like tech billionaires. And so how does that affect the research that is being done? So I'd like to throw that open, having added in a few more bombs. <laughs> I mean, that that's an issue. I mean, so this, is, this is the role of the whole private nonprofit sector, which can often open doors where doors are not being opened because private because public funding bodies aren't taking enough risks to fund the research, which is a problem in itself. And, um, and companies certainly won't do it because they're often the ones involved in causing the problems. Um, so it's very useful to have these things here. I, I am very wary about individual tech billionaires having too much say over any research agenda. I don't think, um, any of them <laughs> have sufficient grasp of the complexities of the problem to, to have that level of influence. Um, so, I mean, it depends to what level they have an, a, a, proper, a proper advisory board with um, scientists that do understand the issues well, um, to what extent that is diverse and represents a range of countries, a range of interests. Um, it, it's of concern when you see some of the big corporations setting up foundations, charitable foundations to fund their particular research interests and then you find out that they're stuffed with people who are sympathetic to the company and not to the wider research agenda and um, yeah, there's a lot of problems in that. So we, we have to be aware of all these issues and ask all questions of funders. It's kind of, I mean, there's also the flip side in that you do get a lot of conspiracy theorists who who just write oh anything funded by that organization is obviously nuts and we can't possibly believe it so the gates foundation gets a lot of attacks from conspiracy theorists who don't have much um background in apart from believing they're part of some some global conspiracy um you know there are criticisms that could be made of, of all sorts of organizations but but yes, we 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 work in a complex world, and that's why we need a lot of researchers, a lot of public funding, so that researchers aren't always looking um, over their shoulder for where the next bit of money is coming from. It needs to be reliable. Um, it needs to be diverse across a number of institutions. It needs to be international. Um, when particularly when governments um, start interfering in the research agenda, as we've started to see, particularly in the US over the last four years. Um, so 
so we need all of all of that diversity. I mean, the, what Heather was talking about with the some of the um, cultural aspects and the diversity of, of distributed governments she talked about, which I think was very valuable. But the the key problem there is is distributed governance is great, but only if if all the actors have similar levels of power. So if you have militaries involved who are much more powerful than than NGOs or um, corporations who are much more powerful than, than um, equivalent NGOs, then then you're not going to get um, a level playing field and, and we need to watch for that. And as researchers, we need to be mindful of that and, and try and chase the money as best we can from the right organisations. And if we find ourselves taking money from more difficult organisations, asking more awkward questions, um, yeah, it's, it's never going to be easy. But we have to keep banging away and, and we have to, a support network is really important. I found that when I ended up leaving research um, or when I ended up leaving academia or, or moving away for, first from moving away from military related work and then moving um, away from academia and working with kind of one foot in the academic world, one foot in the NGO world as I am now. And um, support networks are terribly important in that. So um, that, that's another aspect. Thank you. Yeah, that was a really, I mean, it's such a difficult um, question to answer. And I mean, I don't know if I should say this, but a, a friend of mine often says about when, when talking about should we ex accept this kind of funding? Should we not? Like, at least this way, we know where the money's going. And surely that's better than nothing, better than the alternative. Um, I'd like to bring Jess in on this and then maybe move on to a, a different topic um, that I'd like Tom to address. I mean, Jess, you work a lot with or in the proximity, you know, in, near tech companies and with tech companies. So I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. If, if you... Yeah, I mean, I think this is everything being discussed is definitely an issue specifically within the AI context. You know, there's a huge amount of commercial funding coming into AI research um, and not just funding. You've also got this sort of situation where a lot of the top AI researchers are now taking jobs at the biggest tech companies because they can get, I think, you know, largely they can get much better paid than in academia and sort of having these dual affiliations. So there's huge sort of like commercial incentives and investment in AI research. Um, and, and you only have to look to sort of where are the most mature applications of AI to see this. It's like, it's in advertising, um, it's in social media. Um, actually, you know, our most sophisticated AI systems are there. And then we ask, why wasn't it helpful in COVID? Like, cause AI has been a bit of a disappointment. And I think, you know, the answer is like, well, we haven't been investing in um, the kinds of research required to solve these sort of big global problems. So I think sort of to Anders question, I think we really, we're starting to see a bit more of this, but we do really, need to see more funding um, coming into AI research that's very much kind of dri driven by, yeah, by governments and, and by like public bodies towards sort of solving big problems because there's so much hype around AI solving the world's problems, but then all of the money and incentives going into research or like a lot of the money and incentives going into research aren't really, aren't really driving that. Um, yeah, th I think in general, like AI is a really interesting um, case here because it's a field where we are like where sort of like the world is just starting in the last few years to wake up to its impacts and to to think about um yeah to sort of think about what is the responsibility of, of researchers in the research field and suddenly there's sort of enormous pressure on a bunch of computer scientists who maybe didn't really realize what they were getting into when they first did their PhDs um so I think it's like a really challenging and sort of, you know, interesting intellectually space for, for thinking about these questions of the responsibilities of researchers and, and the incentives on them. And I think um, both Stuart and Heather brought up a bunch of things that have really made me think about, yeah, how do we think about the incentives um, facing AI researchers? How do we think about sort of like empowering those people to engage more in these discussions? Um, and, and we're starting to see some promising moves. So like NeurIPS, one of the biggest AI um, conferences has just this year introduced um, all submissions have to include impact statements so like a little statement at the end of the of the of the paper which says something about the social impact so I think the the community is starting to wake wake up but there's there's a lot of challenges still and I guess I would be interested if either of the other panelists actually have thoughts on 
I'm thinking a lot about what can we as this sort of like relatively new field thinking about the responsibility of research and social impact learn from other fields like climate change, like biotechnology that have maybe been having to deal with these challenges um, for a lot longer. I don't know if any of you have sort of like reflections on that, but I'd be really interested in that if anyone did have thoughts. Um, well, maybe, Tom, you can speak to the militarization. <laughs> That's a good question. Because that I think is a, um, I, I don't know if it's a useful analogy, but it certainly is an analogy. Um, um, yeah, sure. I, maybe not entirely directly, but um, I guess re retreating slightly to where we started, I, I think my shortest answer would be like, yes, funding matters, like re really obviously. Um, and I don't think that's a, a trite statement. And I don't think it requires like putting a tinfoil hat on to go that there's some kind of Machiavellian force controlling what researchers are doing, but the, the preferences for, in fact, not just preferences for outcome, but preference of method and approach that a funding body might have, have a very serious implication for the types of research that can be done, the types of uh, solution that can be proffered. Um, I think one thing that's particularly, uh, kind of in, insidious, you could say, in research broadly imagined would be the notion of being useful. Um, and I'm thinking it's sort of the easiest example to pick on would be the US where there's quite a common argument made that any research that isn't military funded has to do a good job of demonstrating its usefulness, either to business, to profit or to society. Um, again, potentially nothing bad in and of itself in that, but it has an effect on the work that's being done. Um, tying that more closely to, to what you could say is militarization, um, it's often been said to me in the bio field, particularly, um, that if there's certain research you want to do, the DOD is the only game in town. And that's the only person you can approach for funding, the only person that might fund your work. Now, I think the, the 2020 budget year, the research development uh, and it's, it's not just research and development, it's also procurement and some of the pieces. Budget for the DoD was, I think, 104 billion. So this is not a, a paltry amount of money. And of course, most of that is spent on late stage prototyping and fielding and testing. But a significant sum of that is spent on foundational research and early stage research. Within that, most of it probably isn't spent on designing terrifying new bombs or, or terrifying new modes of, of of um, cleanly wiping out a city, to put it quite glibly. But that budget has an effect. The fact that it is funded by the military has an effect. Um, I think it, an extra aspect there is this sort of notion of, of problem closure, where, where the, the place that money is coming from and the priorities that are attached to that can actually kind of shape the model of investigation that we would use to come up with an answer for something. So. Yeah, I want to sort of evade going too far into anything that might be actually the politics of this. But I think it, it, if we look just at the way it shapes epistemology and ontology, the far reachingness of what a funder might want or could want becomes really self-evident. We could have an entire panel just on funding and yeah, following that up. But um, I will move on to another one of Stuart's proposals, uh, the traffic light system. So here's a question from Luke Kemp uh, at CSER, who will be chairing the, the session after this, um, and with a comment from Alex Freeman as well. So here at CSER, we are working on creating both a doomsday model and a potential civilization boundaries framework. Do you, Stuart, have any insights in how to address the problem of mapping the complex interconnections between different existential threats, their drivers, and um, for example, yeah, for example, the military industrial complex and their vulnerabilities. So things like inequality. I mean, one of the ways in which this has been conceived of is a sort of doomsday dashboard type thing. And um, from Alex, we have the comment that traffic light colors are not always ideal because green can seem too reassuring and colorblindness makes it difficult. But in principle, helping people understand the issue in a graphical way, it, it has value. So I'd like to hear what you think on that, Stuart. 
Yeah, just taking the last point first, a warning light system was the easiest one to use as an example. But yeah, um, I mean, that the, you know, the government's using tier one, tier two, tier three. <laughs> it's COVID system at the moment here. Yeah, um, numbers might be better, but then people get confused between is one the worst or is five the worst. So yeah, um, there, there is, there's worth doing some research on that to try and get it as good as you can and bearing in mind the pitfalls of each each use and I'm I'm not an expert on the details so um, um, good points um, please do some more research and, and you'll I think there are some good answers out there but I don't know them I'm afraid um, on the broader issues um, I've got to remind myself what would question I can I can repeat um, part of that question. Um, I've got two yeah. screens open. So, um, it's looking at insights into how to address the problem of mapping interconnectedness. So right. between oh, yes. the different existential threats, their drivers and their vulnerabilities, because as we're as we're seeing with COVID, as we see when we mm -hmm. think about any of them, this it's all a plate of spaghetti. Yes, yes. Um <laughs> There's, there's not an easy answer here. We've been grappling with these things. I've been working for scientists for global responsibility for nearly 20 years, and it's not we we deal with the range of problems constantly. And the easiest thing to do is to focus on individual problems at a time, at at, at one time, and then point out that they can make each other worse, and then give examples of when um, a cascade. Can happen. Um, I, I, COVID nineteen now is, is for all the horror that it's caused. We, we have to make use of what's our understanding of what's happened and examine it as a problem because it illustrates so many aspects of, of any catastrophic risk. The, the failure in in preparedness, um, the failure of governance in crisis, um, the failure of the, the effect of inequality. Um, the cascade and impacting on on um, the economic systems and the technological systems, which economic, which technical systems were resilient. We, we found an amazing value, and this webinar is an example of it. Of how, if it had happened twenty years ago, we wouldn't have had the technology that that helped us link together um, and and stay semi sane by socialising without touching each other or, or meeting each other. Um, that's been tremendously good, but the, it, it's also highlighted that the aircraft industry is a nightmare, and, and um, there's a question about whether it, whether the airline industry should recover, given its environmental impacts and its ease of spreading um, pandemics when they do arise. So, um, yes, it, it's it's not easy to illustrate those. <laughs> I'm coming back to my original point. I'm afraid. Um, I would. I would still think it. I still think it's very useful to highlight individual risk because people can understand it. If there are ten, if you want to put it in ten in the existential risks, or you want to do eight, or whatever works best for the individual ones, and then highlighting the way in which they could interact and, and cascade um, as part of the discussion, I think is is very useful. If you get too complicated, you switch off audiences or or they become despairing. So you do you need what, what I think is more important is you have to whenever you talk about a risk of everything going to hell, you have to talk about, OK, but there are ways in which we could get out of this and giving giving some hope, but not um, not um, 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 un unbridled hope, unjustified hope, but some, you know, there is hope there, but there is also fear there. That getting that balance between the two is also key towards getting motivation for action. And if you do it in, in a way that just scares everybody into paralysis, that, that's a fails or gives it, makes everybody so hopeful, they go, oh, okay, we don't have to worry about this, somebody else is going to deal with it. You, that I think is the more important element of the communication device is getting that right so that people understand how big the risk is and how we may get out of it 
and what their personal role, their role of individuals, communities or organisations are in helping us tackle that risk. That Those are the most important elements. And if, if by doing that, you need to explain the complexity and interrelationship, then then that's when you do it. But if you don't, yeah, don't make it too difficult to begin with. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realise I was muted again there. Um, so we're unfortunately coming close to the end of the time that we've got. Um, I'm going to end with what's been described as a good but hard question and ask all of you to give your thoughts on it. And I hope it sort of links back to some of the, some of the, the topics that were talked about earlier in the week, especially in the panel on um, global justice. And it speaks to what Heather was talking about are existential threats actually driving the increase in authoritarian regimes? And what is a link there? Is there a link to scientific culture as well? I'd like you to think about that. I mean, for me, I think that, you know, as we heard, injustice drives existential risk and the ability to respond. And injustice leads to, can lead to these types of regimes. But I'd like to hear from you, please. <laughs> Tom, I mean, I'd, I would definitely agree. Oh, no, tell me you go. I've. Okay. Um, I guess uh, I'd say there's a danger in making it like a necessary consequence. Um, but I would say, yeah, certainly awareness of, well, the easiest one probably to focus on here would be ecological collapse, which is occurring and will accelerate. Um, there's already a good body of evidence on what scarcity and drought and famine does to regions destabilizing them and often those power gaps are filled with something that looks a lot like an authoritarian regime. So that one's quite straightforward. I guess looking away from the uh, poorer parts of the world to the wealthier parts of the world, the global north, the only thing there is potentially more speculative is looking at, for example, the cognizance of this ecological collapse and the way that is making parts of states that uphold the, the, the normal functioning of the international more violent perhaps. Um, and there's certainly no direct causal link you can draw with that and a rise of authoritarianism, but there does seem to be a correlation in lots of studies between a violent border, um, a more amenable form of people in other parts of the world don't deserve to be here and a rise of authoritarianism. So yeah, perhaps would be the short answer. I should have just said that. I was just going to say, um, and this kind of builds on what Tom was saying, like, it certainly seems like there may be a link, but maybe the link looks more like stemming from sort of like this, it might be sort of like, to some extent, the same underlying mechanism is contributing to both as opposed to one, one causing the other, where, as you said, Lolita, the sort of uh, underlying trend is this sort of rise in inequality, or, you know, like, yeah, inequality and justice, increasing sort of centralization of power in, in places like tech companies and, and governments. and um, that sort of um, perhaps is, and again, yeah, this is all very big picture and speculative, but I certainly have a sense that that's sort of driving um, both a sort of increase in authoritarian regimes and if not necessarily like creating, if not necessarily driving existential risk itself, certainly like exacerbating them and making it, it harder for us to, to deal with them. But yeah, hard question. Yes, I mean, it, it, it's such a big issue, isn't it? I mean, we talked about um, global inequality yesterday, and I thought there were some very useful presentations on that that highlighted the, the feedbacks with governments. The Some of the key issues, I would say, are um, firstly, global inequality is, is a part of any problem that we try and solve and it should be front and center when you are trying to solve any problem that leads to an existential risk or not. Um, and inequality makes things harder to solve. Uh, a lot of the, um, where a lot of governments fail is they just think that they can, oh, if we just focus on poverty, they can at least justify themselves. So if we, if we try and do something about poverty, then everything else is okay. And that's not the, the, the evidence, the social evidence from um, research like the Spirit Level book and, and all that work by um, Kate Pickett and um, 
the other author that I can't remember, um, has shown that inequality is, is key. It's much more than just poverty. Um, so we need to understand that. And I, I guess one, one small thing that I take hope from is that um, whilst tackling inequality has tended to be a left wing preoccupation and we've st certainly in Britain, we're hearing the right use the phrase leveling up a lot, um, which is surely code for reducing inequality. Um, which is what the left has been arguing for years, and now the right is saying that. Now, I'm not convinced that the right-wing parties are actually doing what they claim to be doing, but I think it's that that gives me a little bit of hope. Um, then they're going to do something really silly, and, and, and it, my hope is dashed again. Um, but at least there, there's some seems to be something in there, so long as they don't talk about inequality as the, as the word itself. <laughs> they, they invent their own phrase. Um, that so that's kind of useful. Um, and I also think that there's a real issue around electoral systems. Um, and I think one of the problems that we have noticed, well, one of the problems that strikes me um, in Europe they use proportional representation. In, in continental Europe, proportional representation is the, the dominant um, system of electing government. And we have found that in those systems, hard right governments find it much harder to get power or at least govern on their own. And if they do govern, then they lose it quite quickly. Whereas um, states like Britain and the USA, which have managed to concoct systems whereby their leaders are, are not elected by the majority um, have lurched towards authoritarian or, or populist and I would argue quite authoritarian governments um, and, and that's part of the problem is that we don't have a fair electoral system yeah and, and yeah and then actually you know Donald Trump lost the popular vote in 2016 Boris Johnson came where nowhere near 50% in 2019 we would be in a very different place if those leaders if we had had a proportional representation system that doesn't mean we would have solved all our problems but it meant a a government with concentrated power with such ext an extreme agenda compared with what has gone before would not have been able to get into power without convincing at least 50% of the population that they were sufficiently competent and had our interests at heart. I don't and think I think that had those things happened, the way that we as scientists and we as society think about X risk might well be quite different. Well, that brings us to a little bit over the end of the session. Unfortunately, we could have gone on for a long time and we can hopefully continue during the breaks. So after the break, um, we will have session seven on global catastrophic environmental risks, specifically on systemic collapse from anthropogenic environmental change. So please um, stretch your legs, get yourself a cup of tea, and then click through the agenda on Hoover to access the session. And I would just like to thank Stuart so much for your presentation, for the discussion, and thanks also to Jess and Tom. Tom the illustrator as well, and to everyone for who's been behind the scenes organizing what's been an experiment of a conference, but a brilliant one so far. Thanks. <laughs>